is I think we're going to finish up chapter 14, um, talking about the reactive graph. And then what we're also going to do, um, I'm going to have to be done about 6.55 um, because I have another call here at 7 o'clock. Um, so if I, if I cut it off and I don't finish tonight, since I'm the main presenter, um, just know that I have something to jump on and right at seven. So, um, I may have to jump off right at 655 and I'll be pretty stern about that time, but, um, we'll kind of finish up talking about the reactive graph. Uh, we left off talking about like the react log package, and then we're going to jump into 15. I don't know if we'll get all the way through 15, but I'm going to try my best to see how far I can get. Um, and I will also say that 15, there were a couple parts where I was 50-50 about, so maybe we can have some more discussion about it, um, because some of it just was, one, I didn't have a lot of time to dig deep into it, and two, some of it just didn't make sense to me, and maybe we could talk through it some more, so, but uh, cool. Any questions? Any comments? I think I thought the same about some of the stuff, a little, little. If you. Yeah, and I mean, I was kind of at the point with like 15 in chapter 15, I was like, I wish I had more time to like experiment with it. Like I just didn't have enough time to like pick it apart and to, to like fully understand it. But maybe other people have some input so we could better understand it and figure it out. So let's start off with let me share my screen here. I'm going to go to desktop three. All right. Can everybody see? the slides for tonight? Yep. All right, cool. Um, so we, we left off talking about this concept of dynamism. And I think we kind of briefly talked about it towards the end of our last call. But just to kind of recap where we left off, this concept of dynamism is, is that Shiny forgets the connections between reactive components, especially when the reactive graph gets invalidated. And so what it does is that, that if an input changes, then the output's gonna be invalidated and everything in between is gonna be invalidated. And that includes not only just the reactive expressions, that also includes the relationships in between all those connections as well. And the book talks about that this characteristic is what makes shiny dynamic. And so part of this characteristic is, is that because shiny is dynamic and the reactive graph is dynamic, these reactives or these relationships can change as the app is running. And so the book kind of shares this example where somebody puts a conditional in the server function, specifically within a render text function, to show uh, how the, these behaviors or how these relationships can change dynamically as the app um, is running. And so the other thing the book talks about is the reason why Shiny exhibits this type of behavior is because, again, it wants to perform the least amount of work as possible because it wants to be lazy. And so, and this is especially important when an input becomes invalidated because you really don't want your app to just run all the reactive expressions with all the inputs that you have. You'd rather just run the things that you absolutely need to complete the reactive graph. And so the book kind of shares, it shares this example. Uh, I won't dig too much into the UI. You can kind of pick that apart a little bit. But basically what is important about this is you can see in the server function, there's a render text function here that contains an, a conditional where if the user selects either A or B, it will uh, change the conditional. So if the user checks A, that input will be A. If the user selects B, it's gonna uh, evaluate to input B. And so the book kind of talks about that in our mind, we would think that the way this is set up because technically we're in this reactive context set up by the rendered text, we would think that there's all these different connections. You know, we would say that there's a, a dependency of the output on choice, dependency on A, and dependency on B. But in fact, that is not true because with this conditional here, this conditional limits what the dependencies actually are. And so it goes back to that concept of laziness. Because we're only considering one input here, or we're only depending on one input based on the, on the user's choice of either A or B, 
we're only going to have those dependencies based on the specific choice. And so uh, let me share this example here. Uh, let me jump over to R here real quick. So while I get R kind of fired up here, does anybody have any questions about this um, concept about dynamism? Okay, so let's run this here. Control B, run it. And then again, I'm just going to do this a couple times to, and I might not have the reactive log up, so I'm going to have to check. Three. No, I didn't set up the reactive log, sorry. Uh, react log enable. Let's we'll see. Control P. So there's the React log, and then I want to. Okay, so here's our application. So we could do the A and B input changes a couple times because the React log is in the background recording. And so if I go and look at the React log of three, doing this right, there it is. You can see that um, with this. It's only going to uh, it's only going to fire the specific or it's only going to depend on the specific inputs based on that A or B choice. So if we run through step by step through the invalidation states, you can see as the user changes their inputs to B, it changes the dependency within the reactive graph. Again, going back to that concept of laziness, you know. Um, Shiny is only going to run what is needed. And if A is not needed in this case, it's not going to draw that dependency or it's not going to draw that relationship within the graph. So, but like the, but going back to that concept of dynamism, you have the opportunity in your um, Shiny applications to do this as the app is running. And it specifically talks about it in the case of using a conditional within your, um, like a render text function or a different type of render function or another reactive expression. Uh, the book also talks about like this minor change affects this actual dependency. Um, now, I wasn't 100% sure, and I'm going to open this up to the group because I'm not 100% sure why this is the case. I have an example application that's in the background. But my question is, is does this dependency now, or does this, um, does the dependency not exist because we're not defining A and B in the reactive context. I, this is where that's I my kinda, thought. That's what I was thinking. So, because technically we're not like selecting input A or B actually in the reactive context, that it's just gonna have these dependencies already. So that was what I was thinking. I don't know. Connor, Connor says, yes. Does anybody disagree with that? I do have a, I do have the second, um, I do have a second example that kind of put this in here to look at, and we can look at the reactive log to see if that's the case. But again, I was kind of like, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. So do a couple inputs here, A, B, A, B, do function three, control F3. So now you can see there is a dependency that's drawn between A and B regardless of the choice. So even if I go through my selections and you watch the invalidation state, it's still gonna draw those dependencies. Um, and again, I thought this was because it was outside of a reactive context where we're using those inputs. But what, I was think what I was thinking about, Colin, was the, the fact that we're allocating space or allocating memory to those inputs even though they're not uh even though they're not set yet we have memory ready for it so that the reactive call is waiting for the response or, or from the client to come, to come back to the server before it it makes that that uh footprint uh, that that memory uh footprint in this second example we're providing that opportunity it just isn't called yet so it, it it's not it's not reactive i guess it's not you're not uh, you're not waiting for that that reactive call to uh remove that dependency or remove that that linkage 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I follow in like what I was thinking when yeah. you were when you were talking there is is that we're we're already we already have the dependency here outside of the conditional, right? We're already calling this dependency and we're just saying define it as A and B inside of this reactive context here and we're not even relying on this conditional anymore to call on that input. Yeah, I think it is reactive. Like it's in, it's in the reactive context still, but it's not in the conditional, which is why it, it's always a dependency. I bet I bet if you move to those assignments into like assign that and then put that inside that conditional instead of A. Oh, so like take this whole statement here, mm -hmm. A assignment operator input A and drop it in here. Or, or maybe you, you assign, so if input choices A, assign input, input A to X. If input choices B, assign input B to X. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I see. And then, yeah, yeah. And then just print X at the end. I bet that would have a, it would go back to the first graph type. Oh, okay. I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I think I see what you're saying. So like, um, I think I see what you're saying. So huh. I have to look into that a little bit more. I mean, we can kind of open it up and kind of dig into it a little bit more. Um, let me let me see if I think I know what you're talking about here. So if I go over here, let's go to this app here because it's the same thing. So what you're saying, Connor, is to do what again? So assign both of those inputs to like X. Okay. And then move A, that A assignment into the A section down there. So the A assignment. So, so move yeah. X down into here. Move, move that whole assignment class oh, whole, into whole the conditional. Assignment. Oh, okay. So then this whole assignment down here, X into this, and then this X input B, right? So X down into here, so and then and then like also like print X at the end of each, each of those conditionals. Like print classes. it or just do like an explicit or, return. Yeah, either way. X. Just so it'll so we know it's explicit return. X, something like that, mm -hmm. and then run it. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Could be entirely wrong. Hey, we're here to test it out and experiment. This one was kind of threw me off a little bit, and I think it has to do with like how the input is referenced, right? And I think that's what it's trying to get at. Yeah, you're right, because now it just dropped that dependency for input B. And it's based on our selection now. Yep, there it goes. And it doesn't draw the dependency between it. So Connor, are you are you saying that the the if clause or the if logic is what is resetting your dependencies? Yes. Well, it's, it's not resetting it. It's defining it for that one run. Okay. Like one calculation of the, of the of the output. Okay. And then once that's invalidated, it just builds it from scratch again. Ah, so it never knew okay. that it was A before, and now it's B. It just, knows that, it just knows that it's B now. Yeah. Yeah, because before it, it was just calling that, that it wasn't calling the input directly. It wasn't, it wasn't explicitly defining that relationship like before, like if I back up, like input A and B, it was calling this object A, B, rather than the actual input directly. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Learned a little bit there. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else, what else? So that's that. Um, the next thing is the React log package, but I think we've already talked about it enough. So I don't know if I'm gonna dig too much into this, but again, uh, if you wanna access it, make sure you run React log, React enable run your application, you know, test it out a couple times and then, you know, control F3, command F3 will open it up in the background for you to see. And again, the big thing about React Log is remember it's uh, it's recording the actual behaviors and are the actual like inputs and everything. And, and it's walking you through the step-by-step. -step. So 
it's not just the React log, it's the actual behavior of the application and how it goes through that invalidation state and, and the actual validation flow. So cool. Uh, let's see. And I think that's it. That's it for 14. So what other questions do people have? Other comments? Anything else? I was a little unclear on the product log package when the when I first read it, but we've done enough exercises with that. Yeah, I think, and I just gonna we're, we'll talk a little bit more about because because I use the reactive the reactive or react log package here in chapter number fifteen because I think it kind of helps you kind of show some of the concepts in it. But I think if you kind of just take it into the understanding that it's a recording tool to and it's a recording tool and it's a visualization tool. That kind of helped me better understand it. I mean, there's more, probably more functionality out of it, but at this state, that's my kind of mental model of it. But cool. What other questions do people have? All right, let's jump to 15 here. Um, so with 15, these were kind of the things that I thought the chapter was really trying to get at. Um, I think 15 is kind of a, a deeper dive into the specific components of reactive programming, specifically in the context of, of Shiny development. And it really talks about three fundamental building blocks. It talks about reactive values, talks about reactive expressions, and then it talks about observers and outputs. The chapter says it does a little bit more deep dive into observers and outputs as we've been kind of talking about reactive values and reactive expressions. So it spends a little bit more time in that area, but it does also talk a little bit about reactive values and expressions, but it says that the main focus is on observers and outputs. It also demonstrates two tools for controlling the reactive graph. So isolation and timed validation. We've already been kind of introduced to these concepts but the book also expands on this and provides some examples of where you might further apply these. And then it talks about um, understanding how error, message, error messages and signal conditions move throughout the reactive graph because um, error messages can technically be treated as inputs so that they can go through the reactive graph and be an output. And we'll talk about that. And then um, it talks about observing that reactive values are built on reference semantics rather than copy on modify semantics. And so um, I'll talk about that here right, in, right now, here in a second. But this one was kind of, I have a couple questions about this one because I don't necessarily know if I totally understand this part right here. But that was kind of big picture of what, what the chapter wants us to get out of. Uh, what, what the book wants to get us out of that chapter. But let's talk about uh, working with reactive values. And so the book first kind of talks about how we can set and get or get and set these specific values. And there's two different ways to do this. There's a function called reactive value. Uh, so basically it's reactive value and some value. It mentions that this is for only like setting a single value. And there's this other function called reactive values which allows you to set a list of values. So I just thought that, I thought of reactive values kind of like a list object. Um, I'm pretty familiar with lists, but with the reactive values, you can assign names to specific objects. The book also mentions that these are just different syntax. However, they have similar behavior. And so um, it kind of talked about that a little bit. I'm going to jump over to R because the the formatting in the in the notes didn't really come out like I wanted it to, and I think it's a little bit easier to like look at here in an R Markdown file. But um, let me see where I'm at. So here, what we're going to do, and again, we have to work in the reactive console because um, am I in the right spot? Yes. So because we're going to be working with reactives here, and I'm still running my application, so set this. So here's like first example of the get set for uh, reactive values. So here we're just setting a single value for X. If we call this reactive ex reactive here with X, you can see it's 10. Uh, if we want to set it, it's going to be the value goes inside of this specific expression here. We run it. If we run it again, it's going to be 20. Okay. So nothing too crazy there. Reactive values is just a little bit 
different. Um, this time we can actually set, uh, we can actually assign a name to the specific objects within this list. And so if we run this reactive values, we can do the set here. We do the get, we have the value 10, and then we can set it this way. Um, again, notice the difference. Here we do it inside of the function. Here we actually do it referencing with the dollar sign. We set it. If we get it, it's going to be 20. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing too crazy. Just a different syntax. I think the book, I think Hadley in the book, he says he, uh, he relies more on reactive values than he does reactive val. Um, I can't, right now in my head, I can't remember why he said he does that, but he says, you know, he, he, he advocated for reactive values over react val, but so some important things to consider about with these um, reactive or reactive values and reactives is, is that we got to remember that they're lazy. We got to remember that they're cached. So um, they only run when they absolutely need to. And they do that by being lazy and they do that by caching values that have already been run. So the book then goes into this discussion about reference versus copy on modify semantics. Um, I'm just going to, straight up say that I don't necessarily know if I totally understand this concept. Um, but it kind of, the book talks about the difference between these two different types of semantics based on uh, how this would work in an in, in interactive session in R. And then it talks about how it works in regards to a, um, in a reactive context and with reactives. So when you're in a type of interactive type of uh, programming mode, that's gonna follow copy on modify semantics. So if you look here, we have this value 10, we're assigning it to this name A2, A1. If we run this and we look at A1 and A2, they will both reference this value 10. However, if we assign, or if we take another value, give it another name that's already been taken with A2, A2 will now be changed, but A1 should be unchanged, should be a 10. And so now you have the difference between A2 and A10. So I, so again, I, I'm still getting the hang of this here. The way I kind of understand this, and it talks more about this in chapter two in advanced R, and I think this is probably the best source to go to if you want to kind of really understand how this works. But the way I understand it is, is that with this copy on modify behavior, what we're doing is this number 10 is what's actually being stored in memory. And what we're doing is, is that we're just assigning specific names to this value that's stored in memory. And so if you go to chapter two in advanced R, what it does is it talks about, um, you can actually get the specific address for where it's stored in memory. And I say that very loosely because th this is kind of where my mental model breaks down, but you can use this function from Lobstar that will actually give you the specific address of these values where it's stored in memory. And so if we do the same thing here, if we run this, and again, we're, we're just doing this in an, in an interactive session. We could see that we have this value 10. You can see, and I'm going to run it all the same because I think this is going to make it a little bit more clear. You could see that that value 10 is what's actually being stored in memory. But then it's just A1 and A2 are pointing towards that specific location in memory. Now, I know we have some, some more people who are more adept with, with computers here. Uh, am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> I think and you're I, right. I think you're right as well. What, what I was thinking about is linked list. So, uh, Connor, when you were doing any of your studies, do you remember in C or C++, the linked list concept of memory allocation? If I, I've never done anything in CMI. Okay, never mind. No, that, never mind. Never mind then. Link list is a pointer, and you have to do memory uh, chaining uh, as you're as you're manipulating your particular uh, uh, 
memory management. Uh, you have to do a cleanup, uh, kind of a garbage collector. And if you break your linked list uh, as you're iterating through it, it literally just loses its brain. It, it doesn't have any idea of what variables are where. This memory allocation of, of being able to apply a label or, or what we would interpret as it uh, versus how the computer is, is uh, managing it, um, it, it this, this draws on linked list uh, concepts. Um, I did not do very good in that particular uh, chapter of, of C++ programming, so um, I'm not going to be an expert at it, but it just kind of, this memory management concept in the background is, is what uh, itches my brain uh, on this. I'll try and send a, a link to the group uh, on this subject uh, just yeah, as I, a uh, primer. I think I've heard of that reference as, as referencing and dereferencing memory and values. Correct. Yeah. And if you break your link list as you're iterating through it, it, you could actually get into kind of almost a stack overflow problem where you're, you're pointing at things that aren't actually the values that you're storing. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually where stack overflow comes from. Um, you, you melt down the entire program. It just stops functioning altogether. So, so just going back to this and if anybody, if anybody's watching this afterwards, like I may be totally wrong. So just, I, I read chapter, I read a little bit of chapter two from advanced R and I think I know what I'm talking about, but it, I remember one thing about reading this is, is like, you're not storing a, you're not storing value 10 in a two, a one, you're taking this value eight, this value 10, and then you're giving like a name, like you're assigning a name that points at that specific thing. And so I remember that conversation, but to kind of go back to where we're going is, is that if we assign this new value or we assign this value, we take this value 20 and assign this name A2 to it now. And we go through this kind of same thing of look at the, look at the memory address. What you'll see is it should be, so A1 will be unchanged. A1 is unchanged because it's 10. A2 should be 20, but then the object should be different then they are different. The E8 threw me off. But if you look closely, and let me just run this again because that was kind of a bad example. You can see that now these memory addresses for the values that these names are pointing to are different. So now this is different in Shiny though. So Shiny, it follows reference semantics. So with reference semantics, what it's going to say is basically we're going to follow the same thing, but we're going to do reactive values. We're going to have reactive values. We're going to have this value of X. Um, we're going to take this value 10, assign it to X, uh, put it or assign these names B2, B1 to it. We run this. We do the same thing. I don't know if this is exactly true. So someone tell me if I'm completely off base with this, but I tried to walk through the same thing you know, objects wise and looking at the memory address for it, it's the same. And now if we reassign this value 20 to it to B1X, B1X should be 20. And because we're having reference semantics, B2 should also be 20 as well. Now, again, to highlight the difference is, is that when we were doing the copy on modi modify behavior, there was no link between these. And so A2, um, kept pointing at that number 10. However, in a reactive context with reactive values, B1X and B2X, they change. They change. They're like, they're, they're almost connected. And so I thought, well, what happens if you look at the values now, once you change them, they're different though, at least in regards to mem the memory address for B1, B2. And I don't know if this is because we're not technically in, in the correct context or environment to be doing this, but this was where my kind of mental model broke down is because the memory addresses are different, but the values are the same. I don't, I'm gonna open it up to the group to say why. <laughs> if anybody has any ideas. Nothing informed by any expertise. I, I, I don't, I, because, I, because when I was going through this, it's like, okay, well, this should follow the same thing, right? Like, if, 
if if it's true, if like if this because B, you know, we're changing B1 and B2 still references 20, then these should be the same memory object. You know, it should be the same like it is up here, but it isn't. So I don't, and maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe it's not important. Maybe the mo most important thing to just take into consideration is that it's going to remain 20 or at least remain that value 20, but I don't know. I'm at a loss with this one. And maybe this is one of those situations where like curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> curiosity killed my productivity. <laughs> so. I don't know if somebody's watching out there and they want to explain this one to me, please do, because it's just it wasted about 30 minutes of my time trying to figure out why this is the case. But, and it could also be that you can't just do this in a reactive context. You can't use um, memory addresses in a reactive context too. It, that could be an option as well. OK, let's uh, let's get out of that rabbit hole for a while. Um, so some of the functions that are used for this, you know, event reactive, observe event, um, and then rec, and then reactive timer, which we've already kind of talked about in some of the other sections of the book. And in chapter eight, you can kind of dig into those a little bit more. Um, the previous cohort, one of the exercises discussed, um, let me see, discussed you to kind of go through like some of the different, um, some of the differences in syntax between reactive val and reactive values. You can look at the specific table. It kind of goes through the different differences, you know, reactive values only for a single value, reactive values are for multiple values. Um, how you define it is different. You know, one's more just one single value, one's like a list. How do you get it? So with a reactive val, it's kind of like a function, but for reactive values, you have to use dollar sign notation. Setting is different. And the class is different too. So with reactive value, it's a reactive val, it's a reactive, it's a function, but with reactive values, it's a reactive values class. So those are the two differences from that exercise right there. The next thing that the book kind of talked about um, was doing kind of what we were doing before about um, reference semantics. I'm gonna jump over to my notebook here, because I think it makes a little bit more sense to look at it. Um, the previous cohort had this um, example in it. It tried to do the same thing where it was taking reactive value and then it was um, assigning X on the Y and then it was taking reactive value as Z. And it uses this function from prior. It's the same thing. It gives you a memory address. And so you can look at the values here. It's one, one, one. But if you assign or if you set a new value to x for x2, double check that it's two, one. No, oh, it's it would be all two because they all rely on each other. So two, two, two. Z is one. Now you can start doing tests with the memory addresses. So is the memory address the same for x and y? So here's x, here's y. So x is two, y is two. Are the addresses the same? It's true. So X and then is two, Z is one. These should be different. They are. And then the initial address for X. So we have X here with the initial X address. Oops, sorry. Hit run that. This should be true as well. So. That's that exercise right there. I did it a little bit different, uh, but I thought this one was a lot better because it had the specific tests within it. So I included the previous cohorts um, answer to it because I thought it did pretty well there. Cool. What questions do people have about the two exercise or the answers to these two exercises or other input? I would just say uh, react. I think we lost you, Kevin. They become a, they become really important. They become really important. <laughs> I, I, 
<laughs> it's okay. We're not laughing at you, Kevin. It's, uh, it's only the technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, you're, I think you're saying something that's really, it's really important for, um, maybe put it in the chat. Yeah, there we go. Reactive value. Oh, okay. Reactive values and modules. Does anybody want to expand on that? This is beyond anything I've done. I haven't touched, touched modules yet. I've haven't. done it once or twice. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I haven't stumbled into modules yet. There's a there's a topic on it in the Golem package management where you can add extra modules, and uh, I kind of glazed over it. I didn't quite grasp or understand modules as a whole. Mm. Inputs across modules. Hmm. You might have to add more to that in the Slack because this is interesting. Because I think I know what you're trying to say, but I don't. I don't use modules too much that I could really. So add if to you want Yeah, I think we lost you. Maybe put it in the Slack, Kevin. I think it, uh, I, I think I, it's interesting. Um, yeah, drop some more in the Slack because that's an interesting point. Um, because I haven't used modules enough to really like fully grasp, um, like where reactive values might come into play, but. I kind of have a semi idea of my, how it might, but huh, that's an interesting point. Um, let's see. Reactive values exercises. Okay, so um, let's see. So we got that one done. So the next thing that the book kind of talks about is reactive expressions. And it, it brings up those two main points again, that uh, reactive expressions are lazy and that they're cached. Um, I think that concept has been pretty clear. It's been stated quite a bit. So it's something that we know. Um, so what's important about this and to show this kind of concept of um, that they're lazy and that they're cached is with errors. So, and sorry about the formatting on this. I, I didn't see that this was an issue, but um, with errors, they're basically like inputs. And so they're cached just like values. And since they're cached, they're going to propagate through the reactive graph and if an error happens again, it's not going to be able to, it's not going to rerun that error again, or it's not going to rerun it and pass it through the reactive graph because once it's run, it's, it's pretty much finished and it won't run again until an input changes. Um, it's a little bit different if it's an output versus an observer. So an output the error is going to display in the app. And many of us have probably had this experience before where you're creating an application and then in your UI, you see a red error. Um, that's just the reactive graph doing its job. It's taking that value and pushing it through the reactive graph into the specific output. Um, observers are a little bit different because we use observers uh, for, for their side effects. And so with these observers, what's going to happen is... Um, it will crash the session or it will terminate the application. So if you do have an error as, as one of the values that get passed to the reactive graph, it will crash the session rather than pushing it through because there's just, um, uh, there's nowhere to like to put it. Uh, the, you can modify this and I'm not real familiar with how to do this and someone might be able to add for it, add to this, but um, you can use a try or a try catch to modify this behavior. Um, that's a little bit beyond what I know how to do, but the book kind of talks about it. So a good example of this is how errors are how error or how that caching kind of works with reactive expressions and with errors as well. It gives this example if and maybe I'll just run this in my I'll run this in my console so we can show it here. So if you look at this here, I got to make sure I'm in a reactive context. So true. So, v. 
So if we run this, what's going to happen basically is it's going to create a reactive that's going to create an error that's going to be dependent on my system time. So it's going to run that. And because it's ran once in the reactive context, it's going to have that cached. So if even if we make it sleep and run it again, because that value is cached, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same message. So uh, error occurred. Yep. So you can see that here it is. Here's the system time, 1843. We wait two seconds and we run it again. We would expect that it would be, we would think that it would be 22, but because reactive expressions are, are, are lazy and then they cache their previous runs, this value doesn't change. So that's another example of why, that's another example of this characteristic of, of caching and, and not being able to, um, uh, not seeing the modification in this error. Uh, why do I have this? Can't remember why I'm going to run this one here. Let's see, five, two, three, one. Oh, so this is another example of how errors get propagated through the reactive graph. So um, I'm going to run this here real quick to show this. So all this application does is you click it, it, it propagates an error, and you can see that the error gets put to the output. You know, many of us probably have had this experience before. If we have an error, um, it gets pushed through. Um, but to solidify this point even more, you can look at the reactive graph. And ooh, rack log. Sorry, I'm in a little bit of trouble. Do a couple inputs. Error, 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 error. Oh, what am I doing wrong here? Hmm. Anybody have any ideas what I'm doing wrong here? I was starting your session. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. When in doubt, uh, shift command, shift command F10, or if you're if you're on a Mac, you can do shift command zero now. I found yeah, they just out. changed that. Yep, so much better now, so you don't have to like modify your mm -hmm. fingers like that. So, and then too, if you have like a Mac, you don't have if you have the touch bar. Um, Makes it a lot better for you. So kudos for that. Um, OK, so let's run this again. China. Sorry about this. All right, hopefully it works this time. If not, we'll continue on. All right, so then now if I open up the reactive graph. OK, there we go. Now we got it up. Um, so then if we watch, you know, if we just watch the reactive graph, it's still going to complete. That's because even though we're going to have an error when we click that or when we actually change that radio button, it's still going to complete the reactive graph regardless of even having that error. So this is going to be in an error state. So you can see that the output invalidated. So it's going to go through the same steps, creating the relationships, going to pull on that value. And even if it's an error, it's going to push it all the way through. OK, so the application is now in the idle state. It takes this error value and pushes it to the actual output itself. So um, but I think most of us are pretty pretty well it was kind of neat to see how that it you know the application does push those through um but i think many of us have had that experience where we've seen the error go through the ui so um the previous cohort had this this discussion about on dot exit uh, i wasn't real familiar with the on dot exit or the logic of it a little bit um, so I'm not going to dig into it tonight, but does anybody have anything that they want to add about on dot exit? I don't really remember the book talking about it too in depth, but the previous cohort had this in here. 
So I don't know, does anybody use on dot exit or have they used it before? No, but I can see a, a case where you want it to do, to do something regardless of whether the previous function was successful or not. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, let's see. So that's that. Oh, I guess tonight is the night of technology issues. <laughs> oh, well, I think when you restarted your session, it caught oh. that, 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 that. I killed the book. Yeah, because that's running on localhost. Maybe that's just a sign. That's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's infectious. <laughs> Side effects. Um, da, da, da. So if somebody's watching this later on in the future, I'm not immune to uh, technology issues as well. <laughs> Um, okay, so the book's rendering right now. Let's see if I can move forward here a little bit. So while this is rendering, um, the book also talks about observers and outputs. And so it's, been, oh, there it is. Now we're back. All right. Do, do, do. Direct to graph. Feminism. No, we're 15. Active expressions, observers, and outputs. This is the last thing that I'll cover, and then we can um, uh, call it for tonight. Um, so with our observers and outputs, really, it talks about that these, these two elements are terminal nodes in the reactive graph. And so it really talks about like what, the, what kind of characteristics they take on. So observers and outputs are forgetful and they're eager. And the book kind of talks about the reason why they're forgetful and eager is because if they were lazy, nothing would get done. The reactive graph wouldn't be completed. And so, uh, in, and most of us are pretty aware of this with our outputs. We assign it basically with the output question mark X. Usually we use this in conjunction with some type of render function, like render text, render plot, so on and so forth. So I think we're pretty um, aware of that. The other thing too is with its eagerness, this eagerness is infectious. So because it wants to fire quickly, what it's going to do is it's going to look for those dependencies when it runs. And so um, basically this idea of eagerness is that once the output um, invalidates, it's going to immediately look for the reactive expressions that it has a dependency on. And then those reactive dependencies will go further and look if there's other reactive expressions and it will go further to even look at the inputs and then it will complete the reactive graph. So it's eager for completion. So outputs and observers are eager to complete. And part of that eagerness is that it is infectious because it's gonna draw those dependence or it's gonna draw those relationships across those reactive expressions and inputs. So observers are a little bit different than outputs. Observers are functions that we use for their side effects. So this was a great example. Um, say we wanna use the function cat where we wanna print like a message, or if we want to write, write to, uh, write a CSV to the file system that we have our Shiny app posted on. And so these observer functions, they really don't do anything in regards to the, the Shiny context, but they may be doing stuff in other environments out shine, outside of your Shiny application. So um, good example, again, write a file, send a message. Uh, another thing that the book talks about a little bit later is, you know, write to a database. You know, observers can be used to write to databases. So um, it talks about that both are creating using this low level function observe. We've seen observe before. And so um, just for the sake of time, I wanna kind of jump to this next example here because I thought this one was kind of interesting. It was confusing at first, but I, I kind of created an example to kind of clarify this. But with the book here, it has this example with um, the reactive value. And it's really important to remember that observers um, don't do something, they create something. And so in the book, what it does is it gives this example here of this nested observe function and how 
it just kind of demonstrates how observers create things. And so if I run this on my console, you can see that once I run it, I get one value for one. If I run it again, I get two points. And if I run it again, I get three. And that's mainly because this, this um, observe in here is adding nodes to our reactive graph. And so to demonstrate that some more, I created an example to show this. Um, so let's see, do I have it? Yes, I do. So um, I, I thought this was best when I saw this in the reactive log. So what I've created is I've created a useless application. Um, all it is, is just uh, hit the button. So you just hit the button. Uh, you think nothing's happening, but once you open up the reactive graph, control F3, uh, tell me I'm not going to start another session. Dang it. Do -do. Run this. So this is a, uh, tonight is the night of issues. Okay, so here's my useless application. I'm hitting the button, hitting the button, hitting the button. Um, I am printing that there's nodes are being added to the graph. If I look at it, F3, here's the graph. You can see that concept that observers create something, they don't do something. And so every time I hit the button, because I have that nested observe function, you can see that I'm starting to litter the reactive graph with observers. Um, because you have that print, that print kind of statement in here built within the application. So what questions do people have in regards to this example? Did this clarify it? I thought this kind of clarified it for me a little bit better because I found this example to be kind of confusing because the, the one, two, three kind of threw me off. But then once you see the reactive graph, you kind of understand the concept that because we have observers create things, um, because we have this nested observe function, it's going to keep adding nodes to the reactive graph. And that's because X changes and it's watching for X. So every time X changes, that input is invalidated and it builds the graph again. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yep. So um, I'm already at 6.55 and I have another call at seven o'clock. Um, I don't wanna cut us off early and, and um, you guys can certainly most uh, talk after this, but um, any other quick questions that I can answer for anybody? No, that was pretty good. Okay. Like I said, I'm still learning this part of it. This one was very abstract to me. So there are probably things that I don't fully understand just yet, but I'm getting better at it. So um, cool. Well, uh, I hope you guys have a good rest of your night. I got to jump off. So I really appreciate everybody joining in. And so I will see you next week. I'll kind of do an update and then see if anybody wants to take on chapter 16 or you guys can chat about it afterwards and I can watch the video and, and we can figure it out. So, all right, guys, really appreciate it. We'll see ya. All right. I'll see you everyone. Thanks everyone.